everybody and welcome to a time with the SL we bless God for this beautiful Friday evening our Father and our God we thank you for your goodness your kindness your love to each and every one of us Father we thank you for all you continue to do for us our Lord and our God even as we go into our ministration this evening I ask that you think through my vocal my heart and you speak through my vocal cords let it be all of you and none of me in Jesus mighty name Amen Amen our message this evening is titled effective leadership requires the right attitude Amen Father, indeed, we have come before you. This is our study time. And to study your holy word, we ask that you give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation, even as we dig into your word. Father, may we have a greater understanding of your truth and what your truth means for our lives today. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. We want to look this evening at the practical ways that we can Be who God wants us to be. We are living in a, this is a real world. How can we be effective leaders in the world we live in today? Let's take, our, let's take a look at um, Philippians 2, verses 5 to 9. That's where we're taking our text from tonight. Amen. Amen. Are we there? In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every other name. Amen. What is an optimist? Would you describe yourself as optimists? Would you just, or as an optimist rather? Because I can't ask a generalized question like that to everybody. I was reading somewhere that an optimist is a person who, when he's falling from the top of a 40-story building, says on the way down, all right so far. Unless you just want to go mad in this world we live in. You do not need to ignore or overlook the facts to be able to look on the bright side of life. Realism is necessary. Realism is necessary. Amen. But you know that we are in this world, but we are not of this world. You are aware of that, isn't it? You are aware of that. So, as a Christian, God has to figure prominently into that your realism equation. Amen? Do you understand? No matter what it is you are going through, yes, I look at the reality of life. But while looking at the reality of life, I am a Christian, so God has to figure in that my realism you see what i have found when god's power and ability to get things done is added to the equation 
Hmm? You find that that your situation is not as bad as you originally thought. Yes or no? Yes or no? Things can be bad for you. But when you say, okay, God, please take control, you will find out that that thing that was so, so challenging initially is not that challenging. I read somewhere that the Latin status quo in English is this is a mess we are in. I take it as it is. This is how I am right now. I hope you realize that Christians as well as leaders, as well as mentors, whatever you want to call it, will get into a mess and a mistake. I mean, and, and, and will make mistakes on occasion. There, nobody is perfect. Don't let anyone tell you that they are perfect. It's a lie. It's a lie. Everybody makes mistakes. Everyone. But you and I need to live with that assurance of God's spirit. That God's spirit is there to help us during our difficult times. So it's, there's no perfection for anyone. Don't let anyone fool you. There's none. And you know, because of the work I do, working in the church, working in ministry, I find that I'm dealing with people every single day. And although we are Christians, we still get discouraged. We still get feelings of hurt. And all of us have our own unique opinions. Everyone has their opinion about something. So, you are no different from me, and I'm no different from you. But I will say something to you. Once you realize that you have shortcomings, you will be sympathetic or more sympathetic towards the shortcomings of other people. Because everybody makes mistakes. Understand it. Everyone makes mistakes. And if you complain about someone's mistake today, Chances are somebody is going to complain about yours tomorrow. And what defense are you going to have when you complain about someone's the day before? Another thing I've found is that if you are not too proud to admit your own mistakes, rest assured other people will also be big enough to forgive you of yours. Am I making sense this evening? And people, because they know the nature of your character, they will also be more willing to admit their mistakes to you. Are you getting me this evening? And this is where the true beginning of humility comes about. I messed up. And if you're a leader, eh, you cannot lead if you're not willing to go to that same place. You cannot correct people if you, are, if you refuse to be corrected. And nobody is perfect. So you ch chances are, you too, you make blunders. You make errors. Any Christian leader must model that self giving service taught by Jesus Christ and that service is required by all the followers of Christ well how did Jesus teach us about leadership Jesus taught us that the leader is not the boss but the worker he taught us that the leader is not the master that the leader is the slave that's what Jesus said so this evening, I want us to spend some time discovering the four elements that make up the right attitude that is required for effective leadership. Amen? Amen? Are you with me this evening? 
Are you with me this evening? Now, this attitude will be the same that was displayed by Christ in his life and ministry. So number one, number one, the right attitude requires humility. Amen. And we all know that Christ is a supreme example of humility and selfless concern for others. Jesus Christ. Many of us, we believe that we cannot control our moods and our attitudes. That's a lie. That's a lie. All of us can control our moods and we can control our attitudes. Paul teaches us that if you're a spirit-filled Christian, you cannot be a slave to your attitudes or the way you feel. You can't. Romans 8.6 tells us, this is from the Living Translation. If your sinful nature controls your mind, then there is death. But if the Holy Spirit controls your mind, there is life and peace. You have to choose. Am I going to go through life acting like a mad woman or a madman? Am I? Why do I keep reacting to every dog that is barking? Why? Christ modeled humility in the fact that he did not hesitate to set aside his self-will. He was a deity. He is a deity. And he became a man. So you have God becoming man. But he did not come to earth and say, because I am God, I am going to act like God. He went through all the emotions that we went through and yet did not sin. As, as, as God, Jesus Christ had all the rights of deity. And yet during his incarnate state, he surrendered that right to manifest himself visibly as the God of all splendor and glory. There's so many things he could have done that he didn't do. They abused him, abused him, abused him. He said he's from the devil. There are some of us, small arguments, you want to just, I must prove that I am right. I must prove. Who is it who want to prove you are right? Foolish people. People that cannot, they will not make a difference in your life. They tell you, calm down, calm down. No, I can't be calm. I don't like it when they cheat people. I don't do that. Do, do. Many of the Jews in Jesus' day, they had the view that it did not matter what your attitudes or your motives were, as long as you did the right thing. How does that work? How does that work? But when Jesus came and he lived a life of humility, he effectively erased that misconception that it does matter. Your attitude matters. Your motive. What is it that is making you do what it is you are doing? Do you know what I have found? God cannot do anything with anybody who believes that they are of use to God. If you think that I am in the right position, I am the one that God can use. God can't use you. I often ask myself, you know, that how is it that God is able to use me? How is, how is he able to use me? There are times when I'm like, oh, I haven't prayed. I think I, and God will tell me, the Holy Spirit tells me, do you think it is in your ability? It's not in your ability. Nobody can have his own way all the time. In fact, none of us should ever expect to have our own way at all. One thing that humility does is humility involves us admitting our own shortcomings. And you know something? Also, when you seek the good of other people and the results don't favor, they, they don't favor you. They don't favor you. Humility requires us to display a cooperative spirit. 
seeking the ultimate good for the community and local church. I remember I was on um, the school board, my children's school, many years ago. And when we had our meetings, we had the general sessions, we had the executive sessions. And during the executive sessions, we would vote. And if they agreed, if, 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 if we, we came to a vote and the vote was, we agree that everything should be read. And three of us had attended, maybe there were 10 of us on the board. Three of us said, no, everything should be green. Once we've agreed at executive session that everything is red, although I decided I wanted it to be green, when we come out, we all say everything is red. Humility requires each of us to display a cooperative spirit to seek the ultimate good of everyone. So number one is humility. You're not going to have your way all the time. You will not have your way all the time. So please don't ever think that. Number two, the right attitude requires a servant's heart. When I ask in our ministry who wants to serve, everybody says they want to serve. Many people are willing to serve. You want to serve other people if it does not cost you anything. When you find out there's a price to pay, suddenly they lose interest. But there will always be a price to pay if you want to serve. And Jesus went far beyond us in any act of service. He made servanthood his essential mission here on earth. Mark 10, 45 tells us, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I don't think there's any of us that they've told we give our lives as a ransom for the next person. A servant's heart leads to joy because it helps us to become more like Christ. And it's one thing to think of others in an abstract sense. You have to actually do it. Do it. Estelle, I want to do this. I want to. I said, yeah, come now. And then you see people dragging their feet. A famous philosopher wrote glowing words about educating children. But he abandoned his. His own children were abandoned. It was very easy for him to love children in the abstract. But when it came down to practice, that was something else. True service and leadership, <laughs> it is measured by what you do and not what you say. Don't ever expect someone to do something for you if you are not willing to do it first for yourself. Understand? If you can't do it for yourself, why are you expecting people to do it for you? It's like, I remember growing up, in those days, couldn't understand my mother. We had house girls, house boys, nannies, and yet my mother would make sure we sweep the floor. And she would say to us, why will I be training other people's children when I haven't started training mine? And so all those basic things, housework, cooking, we didn't have a choice. We had to do, we had to learn as well as the domestic staff we had. Doesn't make sense. So. You still see people today. Your children are sleeping. Your staff are making their beds. Don't know how tomorrow will be. What is the motive? What is the motive for service? For leadership it has to be love if you come across a person who is always talking about the sacrifices they have to make that person doesn't have a servant's heart because if you're a servant you must sacrifice christianity that doesn't cost anything is not worth anything it's not worth anything number three the attitude we are looking for 
is an attitude that requires obedience. Obedience. Jesus was so committed while he was here on earth to his father's plan that he obeyed it even to the to 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 death. In his obedience, Jesus humbled himself, becoming a man, serving us in the greatest way possibly by paying the penalty of death that we owed for our sins. Jesus didn't sin. He didn't sin. And the thing about Jesus' death was that Jesus' death was not an ordinary death. It was a disgraceful, terrible, shameful death. Death by crucifixion. Do you know, Roman citizens were not allowed to be crucified. And if you are a Jew that were, and you were crucified, it meant that God had cursed you. For anyone that was crucified, it was a curse. And Jesus accepted that kind of death. Can you imagine what they would have been saying to him on the way to the cross? Say, see him, see him, see him, see the man, see. Just last week, they were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. He can't even save himself. Don't mind them. These are all these false prophets. I'm sure that's what he was saying, spitting on him. And you know, when you look at pictures... Of the crucifixion hmm? we see this tall cross the crosses were not tall the crucifixion the, that cross was not tall it was the length of a tree it was just two two trees that they nailed together so they were not far. that's why when you read the stories you can you could that's why they were able to hear the conversation between jesus and the thieves those two thieves it wasn't very high off the ground though they were not that much higher than when uh, what they call it when the, for, for people to hear the conversation this form of punishment was capital punishment it was limited it wasn't a very common thing it wasn't very common so that's why it was like in, when I was younger when they used to in, in, in my home country Nigeria they used to kill robbers at one part of the beach in Victoria Island. This guy Barbie show. So I'm sure people will, they will be thronging there anytime there was a crucifixion. They will throng there. This was limited to non-Romans and to the worst criminals possible. You had to be an in in, in Nigerian English Ogbologbo criminal to be crucified the way Jesus was crucified. And so I don't think there's a better example of humiliation. I don't think there's a better example of selfless attitude for believers to follow than possibly given to that of what Christ did for us. And if a leader has the right attitude, their obedience will always be evident because right attitudes always lead to right actions. Simple. You know, when I have people trying to explain, I said, you don't have to explain what you are doing. If you have the right attitude, you will do the right thing. Christians and leaders, they need to live exemplary lives. You cannot, you have to think, always think ahead, be intentional. This thing I want to do, this thing I want to say, How, what is it going to result in? We must never show favoritism. We must strive to keep our lives pure. You are called to a higher ac um, um, account, uh, a, a level of accountability. We must never do anything to receive praise or honor. Because everything we do is to bring glory and honor to God. So be careful when people are telling you those things you want to hear. As Christians... Christ and his church, they must come first. It says you decrease for him to increase in you. So leaders are not just called to be capable. They are called to be committed to the course. You don't put your hand on the plow and look back. You have to cut off now. Number four, the right attitude requires a positive vision. And we see this again in the life of Christ. He kept his focus on the ultimate positive goal of display. Uh, or he, he was there to display God's love to mankind and to redeem us from our sins. He didn't change. His vision didn't change. 
Someone didn't come and tell him, why don't we do it this way? You know, there are other ways we can do the same. He was positive in everything, even when things, you know, I, I was talking to a member of the ministry and I said, you know, for three years, Jesus knew that Judas was going to betray him. He knew. And yet, he just kept smiling at him, smiling at him, smiling at him. That last day, he said, guy, this thing you want to do, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it quickly. Just do it quickly. But Jesus was not a grump. Can you imagine if he was grumpy? Negative. He's coming, he's coming, he's coming. This nasty guy is coming. They'll just cross to the other side of the street. Nobody wants to make eye contact with him. And there are certain things that I read in the Bible and I try to understand. And now, looking at his attitude, things are clearer to me. Because we see that Christ's obedience was followed by the Father's exaltation of him to the place of highest honor. God exalted and honored the one that men despised and rejected. Rest assured that for as long as you are doing God's work and people are abusing you, they are rejecting you, they are saying all these things about you, God is going to lift you up. What is it we say about John the Baptist? John was, say look at him, madman. Madman. See him, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. But when they speak about John, when we speak about John today. Now, when you read that Jesus was exalted and honored to the place of highest honor, this exaltation refers to his resurrection, his ascension, and glorification at the right hand of the Father. At the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus is not merely a title. It refers to his person his position of dignity and honor. It's not an ordinary name. It's not an ordinary name. Beloved, we ourselves, because we are church leaders, we are ministers, we have to motivate ourselves. We have to keep on pushing ourselves. We have to keep moving on so that we also can encourage others. Leadership is the art of getting someone else to do something because you want that thing done. You encourage people. That's how it works. And I say this. I say this. I think Sister Daniela Carte is on. You know, there's one thing that I have learned to avoid as a leader. We've never done it that way before. No, there's nothing that we are not willing to explore for as long as it does not go against the word of God. If you're a good leader, you will try not to offend anybody that has a weak conscience. But I will say something to you. In trying to avoid them or trying not to, not, not to offend them, you must not be intimidated by a few vocal critics because everybody has, everyone, they have their own mouth. They will talk what they want to talk. What is vision? Vision is the ability to see all the positive, even if everything you see around you is negative, and keep on moving, keep on moving, keep move, uh, moving people towards the positive. Look at Noah now. The rain had never fallen before, yet he was building a boat. If he was not able to encourage his sons and their wives, how would he have finished that boat on time? Should I tell you what I believe? Should I tell you what I believe? Methods are many. Principles are very few. Methods may change, but principles never do. That's what I have as my watchword. There are many ways to enter a market. Many ways that I can use to enter the market. But when I get into that market, there are only certain things that I can do when I'm there. So when it comes to the word of God, I cannot waver. I am not permitted to waver. But in the side of opinion, ah, I'm open-minded. Because I cannot use your opinion to train myself. I cannot use your opinion to go to school. I cannot use the next person's opinion for anything. 
It's just an opinion. And you know something? If you're a Christian leader, and, or if you're a Christian, you have to remain flexible. Be receptive to change. If it promises to win others to Christ. Do you understand? Remember I've said for as long as it's the word of God. Ask yourself this question. Ask yourself, okay, so I've told them in the ministry, we can only do things one way. Keep on doing it that way. Keep on doing that that way. And we are knocking our head on the wall. Now, <laughs> ha. am I humble enough to say, let's do it another way? Am I humble enough to say, seems like I made a mistake. Oh. Sister Eniola's suggestion, why don't we try it? You have to ask yourself the question. Is your goal to glorify Jesus Christ or is it to glorify yourself? Do you desire to sacrifice for the kingdom or do you want to hold on to nothingness in your comfort zone? Leadership is not about my will be done. It is always about your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're getting ready to close now. I remember this story during the American Civil War. There was this army general who was put in charge of the great army of Potomac. Now, he was not a, he was not a fantastic person. He wasn't a fantastic army general or anything. But this particular man had public opinion on his side. And he fancied himself to be a great military leader. He didn't have tactic, he didn't have strategy, but people just liked him. In fact, he loved it when they referred to him as a young Napoleon. His performance, neither here nor there. And the then president, President Lincoln, he had made him the general in chief, hoping that he would even fit into the role, into the big shoes that he was wearing. Remember, he was only there because he had public opinion on his side. But this man was just enjoying his life. So one evening, the president and two of his staff members went to visit the general. When they got, this was during the war. When they got to the man's house, the man, they were told, had gone to a wedding in the middle of war. So the president and the three men decided to sit and wait. Meanwhile, they had gone to tell this man that the president of the United States of America was waiting in his house. One hour later, the man arrived at home. He didn't even pay attention to the president. He went straight upstairs. And that was it. Half an hour later, Lincoln sent one of his servants, one of the servants in the house, to tell him that we are waiting. The servant came back to report, the general has gone to bed. <laughs> the, other two, the other two associates of the president they were so angry very, very angry. The, how can you keep the president waiting? We have been waiting here for nearly two and a half hours. Da, 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 da. President Lincoln just got up and said, let them go back to their own homes. He said, this is not a time for us to be making points of etiquette and personal dignity. See, if I have to... <laughs> Hold this man's horse and he's walking. I, I walk this man's horse with him on the back. I will do so if only it can bring us success. Beloved, when you speak of the founding fathers of the United States of America, you mention the name Abraham Lincoln. If I were to mention the name of this particular general, you would not even know who he is. And I believe it was the attitude of humility that helped to make Lincoln a man as great as he was and a great president. 
Abraham Lincoln was not thinking of himself. He was thinking of serving others. I want you to think about it this evening. Think about your attitude. You may not necessarily be wanting to be president of a country. You may not necessarily want to be a leader in church or ministry. But even for your personal self, let's spend this weekend thinking about the attitudes that we display. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you. We thank you for this message this evening. Father, thank you. We have come to you in the name of Jesus. Father, we love you. And you know that we love you, Lord. Father, we just want you to know that we want to be pleasing in your sight. We want to honor you. We want our thoughts and our hearts, our attitudes to be pleasing to you, to be acceptable to you. Our Lord and our God, but we need your help. Because a lot of the time, we allow our feelings to take precedence over our attitude. Father, we all need an attitude adjustment. And so we ask you, Lord, will you help us today? Search us, O oh God, because you know our hearts. Try us and see our thoughts, Lord. Whatever thing is in us that is not of you, Father, take it out in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we ask you this evening to please change our hearts, change our emotions and our attitudes right now. Father, your word says that you take away stony hearts and give us hearts of flesh. Father, you take away the old spirit, you give us new spirits. So, Father, this evening we are asking that right now you give us your heart and you give us your spirit and as we are praying lord we want to speak even to our own souls and tell our souls come to attention right now we speak to our souls to line up with our spirits because our spirits are filled with god's holy spirit in the name of jesus father we ask that you will fill us with your perfect love that love that casts out all fear Father, create in us clean hearts. Renew that right spirit within each of us. And Lord, if there's any way we are harboring sin, bitterness, unforgiveness of any kind, Father, convict us, Lord. Father, we are asking you to give us truly repentant hearts and help us to repent from our heart. Father, help us to make things right with you and to make things right with others. Help us to forgive, Lord, just the same way that Jesus Christ forgave the thief on the cross. Father, we are asking for that anointing to forgive in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, help us to honor you in everything. Father, we thank you for every commandment that you command us today. Because they are not too hard. Your word says that we can do all things through you, Lord, who give us strength. It means that we can obey you and we can maintain right attitudes before you. We can also have right hearts in your sight. So, Lord, we just want to thank you for working in us right now, both to will and to do your good pleasure. Father, thank you for bringing our souls in alignment with your spirit and your word in the mighty name of Jesus. Our Lord and our God, we love you. Please forgive all our sins of doubt, unbelief, and any other sin that we have embraced. We are so sorry, Lord, for sinning against you. Father, please, you are God, wash us in the blood of Jesus. Father, fill us with your Holy Spirit and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The long and short of it, of it that is that we want you to make us like you are. Father, we will not stop giving you the praise and the glory. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. And so I ask you, are we, is any of us struggling with our emotions today? 
my prayer is that we've prayed this evening. But we must not forget that God knows our frame and is mindful that we are nothing but dust. Remember that when we confess our weakness and our neediness to him, he rushes in to help us. Even at the point of rearranging our thoughts in order to get us right with him every way, God will do that for us. Don't ever forget it. And so, faithful Father, we thank you for this great opportunity to come and study your word. We ask that we will continue to have an even deeper understanding of what you have shown us in your word today. So that we can apply it in our daily lives. Father, let the light of your word shine before us. Father, we thank you for everyone who has joined this study on Instagram. Bless each one and every one of us as we go. We are now armed with your word and this word will bring you glory through our lives in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, thank you. Cover ourselves, Lord, even as we go into this weekend, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. God bless each and every one of you. Thank you for joining me this Friday for a time with the SL. I pray you have been as blessed as I have been blessed. God bless you. God bless you. God keep you. God make his face shine upon you. Remain lifted in his presence always. Amen.